Isaiah chapter 28 this morning. We're going to be picking up in verse 8. Chapter 28 and verse 8 and working our way through a portion of the chapter. Um, you know, I titled the message this morning, um, God is not mocked. And I want to change that. I can do that. So I am. The title of the message this morning is When God Speaks, When God Speaks. And I want you just to kind of jot that down because really this is what is taking place here. The Lord in the next several chapters of uh, Isaiah is speaking directly to the people of Israel, uh, Judah for that matter. And what he's doing in the first portion of chapter 28 is using the people of Ephraim, which is another name for Israel, which is a reference to the northern kingdom. I think sometimes we don't realize when we're reading through the prophets as to who they are speaking to. In general, we say God's people, but it wasn't the totality of God's people. It was directed toward a certain group of God's people because in the time of the prophets, we see that the kingdom was already divided. So you had the northern kingdom and you had the southern kingdom and in the context of Isaiah 28, in the next several chapters, leading all the way up to chapter 31 uh, and, and on, the Lord is speaking to the people of Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, but he's using the northern kingdom of Israel, Ephraim, or known as Israel, as an example. And he's saying, watch and see how I have dealt with the northern kingdom of Israel, and though it shall be among you if you fail to listen. So God is speaking through Isaiah to the people of Judah, but using Ephraim or Israel, the northern kingdom, as an example. Now, here's how close that example is. Remember that in Isaiah's day, it was not too long after Isaiah's prophecy and warning to the people of Judah that God would ultimately take the northern kingdom of Israel captive by the Assyrian Empire. And from that point on, the northern kingdom of Israel will be really an Assyrian province. And it will no longer be part of Israel, so to speak. And then the people of Judah seen this. Also, too, Assyria at the same time would try and attempt to take over all of the land of Israel. And as they went to Judah to their very gates to do so, the Lord promised the people of Judah that they would not be taken in by this way and or by or at this time. And what we see that in verse six of chapter 28, the Lord says they will come to your very gates. But the Lord says for a spirit of justice to him who sits in judgment and for strength to those who turn back the battle at the gate. So God's deliverance when he would protect them against the, the Assyrian. And we see that very clearly that the Lord is promising that he would take care of them. In chapters 36 and 37, we see where they attempted to take the southern kingdom, but they couldn't because that was not a part of God's plan. So you would think that Judah would listen. Well, the sad reality of it is, you know, about 150 years later or less, the southern kingdom was taken captive, not by Assyria, but by the Babylonian Empire. At about 605 BC is when Nebuchadnezzar, who at, the point, at that time was the uh, leader and or the leading general of his father's army, as the Babylonians were invading that region of the world, and then it is stated, history tells us that Nebuchadnezzar left his fight at Jerusalem, went back to Babylon. It was there that his father had died during that time, and the second time around, he came back to besiege the city of Jerusalem. He was now king of Babylon. And uh, it's an interesting dynamic because it was several times that Nebuchadnezzar came and he ultimately in 586 BC destroyed Jerusalem, the people of Judah, and destroyed their temple. And it's just interesting fact. So something to always take note of at about 605 BC is when Babylon first invaded Judah. And it's believed there that that's when Daniel the prophet was taken captive. And thus we know the book of Daniel was written 
and because he was one of the first captives taken. And then at about 596 B.C. is the second time Nebuchadnezzar came back and um, he came back to besiege the city again. And it was there when Ezekiel the prophet was taken captive. So both Daniel and Ezekiel were ministering at the same time. Daniel was in the palace of Babylon where Ezekiel was on the countryside with the people. Same message, just different places in Babylon. And then in 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar finally comes with one last blow and destroys the temple, and thus the temple had been destroyed. So all of this was, was prior to this warning, that God was warning the people of Judah, and God clearly was warning them through what would soon take place with the people of Ephraim. So remember that in the context of chapter 28, the Lord spoke in regards to a woe. Now remember, there are several woes in the next several chapter. A woe is a prophetic word of warning. And this prophetic word of warning clearly is that God is going to deal with the rebelliousness and sin. A woe can be given to a nation. A woe can be given to God's people. It's just the fact that there is a warning. And the warning here is to the people of Judah for um, the next uh, eight chapters, if you will. But Ephraim is an example. So we noticed a couple of things about the people of Israel, the northern kingdom. One, they were idolaters at heart and they rejected the word of the Lord. And instead of wearing a crown of glory, they exchanged the crown of glory that God gives. In verse five of chapter 28, it says, in that day, the Lord of hosts will be for a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty. They had no desire to be crowned with the crown of glory as the word of God promises. But rather they chose to be crowned with a crown of pride. That is the picture here. And so they exchanged their crown of glory or exchanged the ability to receive a crown of glory with a crown of pride. And so in other words, they embraced pride and rejection. So they had no desire to trust in the Lord, nor the things of the Lord. And ultimately, then the Lord deals with them on this matter. So look at that. Now, he then goes on to say here that the people of Judah also erred in this same way. That they themselves also fallen into the same actions and response to God's word as the people of Ephraim. So he uses them as an example, and he's saying here, listen, like they have been, you know, uh, rejectors of the word of God, they embraced idols, they had no desire to receive what the Lord might have for them. He says, but they, verse 7, also erred through wine and through intoxicating drink out of the way. The priests and the prophets have erred through intoxicating drink. And so those who were to be the spiritual leaders and or the ones that would be directing the people to worship the Lord God have also found themselves in a place where they have fallen into the same dissipation of drunkenness and rejection. So drunk in a way of rebellion, but also rejecting the Lord God and also being drunk with intoxicating drink. Remember, we talked a little bit about the Bible saying that no drunkard will inherit the kingdom of God. And so this is clearly uh, them pursuing something outside. They're pursuing other means to satisfy. For them, intoxicating drink was more satisfying than the worship of God. And so he says, the priest and the prophet have erred through intoxicating drink. They are swallowed up by wine. So that was never the intention of wine. Remember, abusing what God has given as a blessing, and then it becomes that very curse because you forget what its you know, initial intention was you know, or purpose was. Sometimes that's what we do. And we talked about that, where we forget what God initially had did this for. You see, many of us are thankful that we've been set free and we've been delivered and God has forgiven us of our sins. And here's a clear picture of that. Sometimes we, you know, we're so free that, that we feel that we're free to do whatever we want. And we forget of the very fact that it was God who reached in to the beggarly elements that we were in and forgave us of our sins. He pulled us out. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 that by God's work, by his doing, we are a new creation. It says 
All things have passed away. The old life is gone. And behold, all things have become new. You're not a refurbished you. You are a new creation. And it's a spiritual thing. And this is what, this is what God does with his people. So when God brought them into this land of blessing, he brought them out of what? Captivity and or oppression and prison in Egypt. Remember that? And that's what we read in Deuteronomy 11. He says, I br I'm bringing you out into a land flowing with milk and honey. And rather than receive the blessing of the Lord in a land of abundance, they use that abundance to dishonor the Lord. And sometimes we can do that as well. We can take what God has given us to be intentionally good for you and me. And in the New Testament, we, we title this Christian liberties. We have liberties, and we do have liberties as Christians. We, we are, you know, uh, not brought under the bondage of legalism. And, you know, when people feel controlled, when people feel like there's too much of a list of do's and don'ts, uh, that is a result of pride. If the Bible says this is exactly what it is and there has to be a flow of order and things, we, we have to follow something. Just because God's forgiven us of our sins doesn't mean that we are now aware of that what we were following was bad. And now that we're not following that no more, you know, we've been freed from it because we're not addicted or whatever the or whatever your situation was. I don't know. It's not always addiction. But here's the point that we somehow in some way can then begin to develop or shape our own system of how we're going to walk with the Lord. No, the Bible says very clearly in the book of Amos, can two walk together unless they agree? The answer is no. So when God brings us out, when God brought the people of Israel out and put them into the promised land, God also gave them his word, the law, for a standard and a manner in which they are to live. The whole purpose was that they would live a righteous life before God. And God, knowing that they could not keep the law, what did he provide? He provided the sacrificial system because he knew that they would break the law because in our humanity, it's not an excuse or a license to sin. It's God's grace. Because if God would just say, here, I brought you out, and now if you mess up, you're doomed. For the Christian, he says, I've forgiven you of your sins. I delivered you from your addiction or whatever it was you were going through. And now that you're a Christian, if you mess up one time, you're going to hell. There's no second chance. It's not the God we serve. At least that's not what we see in the Old Testament. When he dealt with Israel, he says, listen, I understand that you're going to make mistakes, but you're no longer going to be who you used to be. You're not going to be a prisoner in Egypt. You're not going to be slaves to the Egyptians or Egypt being always being a picture of the world. You're not going to be a slave to the world. And here's the standards now by which you will live. You live for over 400 years under this system of you know, Egyptian theology, if you will, and the worship of Egyptian gods. And God was gracious to them because even when they were in the wilderness, the Lord told them, you know, you struggle with your idols. Put your idols away and look to me. So God doesn't just tell you, hey, this is, you know, you just got to be righteous. That's it. And leaves it there. No, he says, here's how you can practice righteousness with me. You might not get it the first time, but there's a second and third and fourth because God is gracious. So he gave them a sin. He gave them his word. Right. And so now you look at this here and this is what kind of Isaiah is kind of bringing back into their understanding. Like there is nothing that is or should be of any surprise. God never intended for the priest and the prophets to take the wine that was a part of a blessed land or to take the wine that is a part of a land of flowing of milk and honey and use it to get drunk. Some would then say, because they have an issue with this and don't want to take responsibility, because that's one thing that you have to do is take responsibility of your disobedience. They would say, well, then if God didn't want them to get drunk, he shouldn't have put it there. Well, then how is that a God of love and a God of grace? And how is it there for you to choose or not choose? So this whole thing was that they chose to, listen to this, abuse what God gave them for their good. They chose to reject. The moment you reject God and his word, it doesn't matter what blessings you're receiving from the Lord. They will never be used for its intended purpose because your view of God is already done. It's distorted. 
And so this is what he's saying here is they swallowed up by wine. They are out of the way. And what does it mean here that they are out of the way? In other words, they are wayward and they are crooked. So now they're not thinking straight. And this is what drunkenness does. This is why the Bible condemns drunkenness. Because in the book of Proverbs, what does it say? It says, do not give intoxicating drink to the king. Why? Because it would then perhaps maybe alter his ability to judge righteously. And so the same with priests. Priests were not allowed to do that because God did not want them. Listen to this. God never wanted the priests coming into his presence, the Holy of Holies, under the influence of something else. And so the priests were not even allowed to do that. Listen, you could drink wine, but you could not partake in intoxicating drink. And so the reality of all of this is, in a sense, the Lord saying it is holiness to God. Anything that comes under a different type of mindset is not holiness unto God. And so he goes on to say they err in vision. Not only do they err in the way, there's no vision or no clarity among them. This is in verse 7 still. And then he also says this. So they're wayward and they're crooked. Their vision, there's none, and there's no clarity in what they're doing. And then he says here, they stumble in judgment. They're irresponsible. They're awful judges and they're selfish. So this is what and how and the manner in which the priests and the prophets were ministering. Listen to this. They were, and then look at verse 8. For all tables are full of vomit and filth. No place is clean. So when the leaders are filled with the stench of their sin, the nation has no hope. Because these are who the Lord has placed there. Now, remember, this is how easily it went south for the northern kingdom, the people of Ephraim. When we look at 1 Kings chapter 12, where all of this begins to transpire, it's just an interesting dynamic because you see in verse 25 that Jeroboam, he established a kingdom of idolatry. And then the Bible in Chronicles account of 1 Kings 12 says that many of the families of the northern kingdom left. It says the priests left. Um, the families that helped, you know, because you had, you know, Levites and those that were actually in the northern kingdom. And they left. Because remember, in the southern kingdom, Rehoboam was just over Judah and Benjamin. And then the Bible says that many begin to leave. The Chronicles gives the account of 1 Kings 12. It says many begin to leave and go back to Jerusalem. Because you know what they said? What Jeroboam is doing is not right. And when Jeroboam built these golden calves and said, hey, listen, this is the God that brought you out of Egypt. My goodness. That should have right away, looking back in their history, they should have been like, this isn't the God that brought us out. This was the God that condemned us. Because in Exodus 32, remember, as they worship that golden calf, and the Lord then tells Moses that he's on Mount Sinai. Remember, he's getting the law, he's getting the word. And he says, Moses, get down there, the people you know, they've gone crazy they're, they're, And Moses comes and what does he find? He finds the people of Israel at the base of Mount Sinai with Aaron leading them in the worship of this golden calf. It's an interesting story, right? Well, we know that how the Lord dealt with that then was what? Well, Moses comes and he breaks the tablets of the law, which is a clear indication of what they were doing. They were breaking God's law. And then Moses says, hey, you know, who, who is for me? Who is on the side of God? Who is on the side of, of the Lord God? And it was those of Levi that stood up and said, Moses, we are with you. And then Moses says, here, draw the sword and then begin to go and wipe out those who are not for us. And the Bible says there in Exodus 32 that 3,000 people died that day because they chose to worship the golden calf. Now, what's interesting is they began to 
The worship of idols brought death, right? Well, then here we are, and what does Jeroboam do? He builds two calves, and he puts one right at Bethel, right at the southern border, before you go to the southern kingdom. And they had to, because all the tribes, all 12, together or divided, it didn't matter, were required by God's law. Leviticus 23, read it. The seven feasts of Israel, by law, they were required three times a year to go and worship at the temple. Well, the temple was only in Jerusalem in the southern kingdom. So all of these from the 10 tribes with Jeroboam were going over there and Jeroboam began to have fear in his heart and say, they're going to probably want to stay there. They're going to probably say, we love that king and we're going to kill you. That's why he, out of fear, he built these two golden calves and he told the people, it's too far for you to go to the southern kingdom. There's no need for you to go over there. You know what? Here is the gods that brought you out of Egypt. Worship God here. He'll accept it. He'll receive it. And the ones that had a desire to follow the idolatry or weren't planted and rooted in the word, they said, okay, Jeroboam, but what about our three feasts? He says, don't worry, we'll make our own calendar. Well, who's going to lead us? Don't worry, I'll make my own priesthood. And he did. And all this you can see in chapter 12, 1 Kings. And what's interesting here is that as Jeroboam did this, Chronicles account says that many began to leave and they went to the southern kingdom. But Jeroboam stayed. And this is why the people of Ephraim, when God gave the children of Israel the land, it was that they would be blessed and they would worship God and that they would be a light to the nations around them that the God of Israel is the one true God. In the face of idols and idolatry that was rampant in that day, and still today it is, the message of God's people and or the commission or the command has never changed. Today, the church, the body of Christ, you and I, Christians, we call ourselves Christians. Well, we don't say we're Christians because we're a part of a church. I think this is where we as church leaders and pastors and even parents and grandparents got it wrong. We're, we're, we're misteaching this next generation. We do a good job at bringing them to church, sometimes by force by manipulation, but listen to this. We need to teach them why we come to church. There's a reason why. And the reality is in the reason why, it's because of our relationship with the Lord God, who is the one true God. There is no other God. Remember Isaiah says this time and time again, you know, as the Lord is speaking to the people of, of, of Judah, he says, there is no other God beside me. And who can declare it as I have? Who can speak of the ancient things and it come to pass like I have done? He says it very clearly. You could read Isaiah 41 and 44. He says it. None can do that. Only I, the Lord, can. And so he's saying here that the people of Judah themselves now have begun to practice the same things as their brothers there on the northern side border northern part he goes on to say for all tables are full of vomit and filth no place is clean in other words once you defile it this way you, you there's no coming back because what you've done now is you've given your heart so this is why i think sometimes people wrestle with this now remember they're going to begin to now kind of mock isaiah and this, is, this has a lot to do with what we're looking at today. They have a desire to mock him uh, because of their desire to resist and reject God. So he goes on to say, really, this is kind of what the saying is, okay? The saying, in other words, this is what the drunk priests and prophets and the disobeyers are saying. Whom will he teach? Knowledge. And whom will he make to understand the message? You see, in their drunkenness, they mock the message of Isaiah. And they would reject it. The simplicity of God's word. And they say, those just weaned from milk, those just drawn from the breast. They said, you know, Isaiah, listen, your message is childish. We don't believe that junk. We don't care to know the word of God. We have no desire for it. And they go, you know, all it is, this precept must be upon precept, precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. In other words, they're saying, Isaiah, your message is just blah, 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 blah. 
And I think there are two things that are in view here. One, they're saying, your message is the same thing over and over and over again. We ain't trying to hear it. It's meaningless to us. It's, it's childish. It, it sounds stupid. They failed to realize that it was God who was speaking to them. And they looked at Isaiah's message and they said, all it is is the same thing over and over again. Precept upon precept. Line. Well, in their mockery, they were also saying something good because the word of God should be line upon line, precept upon precept. Listen to this. And it should always be do it this way, not that way. There's only one way, not many ways. And this is it. And it should be basic because God's word is simple. Right? And guess what? They're saying it's just blah, 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 blah. It's the same thing over and over again. Well, isn't that what the word of God is for you and me? How many times have you here, maybe not all of you, but some of you, anybody here ever read through the entire Bible? I read through the Bible every year. I just pick a different translation. It's not hard to do, but I'll tell you what, I'm always growing deeper in my faith and gaining a little bit more knowledge of the word, but the message never changes. I find myself hearing the same thing. And at times, listen, even when I'm teaching through the Bible, this, I'm going to be honest with you guys. This happens to me. I get to a passage of scripture and I'm like, we've been talking a lot about the northern kingdom, southern kingdom, Babylon, and all this stuff. And then people say, listen, people tell me, this is why I don't preach Old Testament on Sunday mornings. It's just repetitive over and over and over of Israel's disobedience. And all the prophets are preaching the same message just at different times, but the message doesn't change. And it always has to do with their captivity with Babylon and, and Assyria and, and, and all these things that transpire, you know. So that's why we kind of just stay away from the Old Testament. And I'm like, I've been teaching the Old Testament since I've been a pastor, 14 years now. And I just have Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah. And in 14 years, I have taught through the entire Old Testament. I think that's remarkable. But it is the same thing. It's the same message. It never changes. Why? Because in our heart, we reject the truth of God. In their heart, they were rejecting the truth of God's word. And listen, they're even saying, they're saying, hey, you want to know what? Your message is meaningless, blah, 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 blah. Actually, in the original language, in the Hebrew language, that's exactly what it's saying. Many people have wrestled with this. What, is it, what do they mean? Well, I think it's twofold. They're, in a sense, mocking Isaiah's message. And then they're saying, it's just, it's just the same thing over and over again. Well, that's what it's supposed to be. So in one instant, they're not seeing it for what it is. And why are they not seeing it for what it is? He says, because they are out of the way through intoxicating drink, they err in vision. They err in vision. Now, if you, can, you know, just can for a moment remember that this idea of erring in vision is really important because this is common among those who reject God's word. When they err in vision, the idea behind this is that which has to do with receiving the word of the Lord. Now, remember that this is kind of the idea here of what it means to err in vision. Now, there's a manner in which we are to see. We always talk about, you know, a biblical worldview. What is this? How do we have a biblical worldview? This is what we should have. This is why we come to church. We come to receive the word of the Lord. This is why God gave Israel the law so that they would interpret now their freedom and their deliverance through the lens of God's word. Life is to be viewed. Worship of God is to be viewed. This is where I believe the church has erred. And the church, <laughs> there are some who are drunk in the church. Really, there are pastors who drink and think it's okay to drink. And they encourage their congregants to drink. And, and they're, they, they call them sipping saints. You know, uh, I don't see where that's biblical. And they have erred in their ways. 
And those who do embrace that style of, of ministry, because they do, you'll notice there is a pride and arrogance about their interpretation of the word of God. And yes, I would agree with them. Of course, if you take a sip of wine or you drink a, a beer, are you going to go to hell? Of course you're not. But that doesn't mean it's okay for you to do that. The Bible says drunkenness. And it'll be just a matter of time before you walk and fall into that. Whether that is phys uh, physical by way of consumption, the altering of a person's vision, or it could also be spiritual. When you allow yourself to use other means to satisfy what only God can do in your life, then you will perish for lack of knowledge. And what does the Bible say? Without vision, the people cast off restraint. And the word there for, for vision literally means without a word. If you're not given the word of God, the people live wildly. So really what happens now? The same thing that is taking place here. Let me give you that by way of reference, just that way so you can kind of take this, you know, passage of scripture and just kind of take it in. I've, I've been waiting so much to get there. In Proverbs chapter 29, the Bible says in verse 18, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint, but happy is he who keeps the law. Happy is he who keeps the word. Cast off restraint. This is exactly what's happening. We shared this a lot, but we have to share it. Guys, just listen. Several different translations. The NLT says when people do not accept divine guidance, they run wild. The people of these pro priests and prophets, that's what they were doing, right? Listen to the Greek Septuagint. The Greek Septuagint is the Old Testament written in Greek. This is what the Greek Septuagint says. It says, there shall be no interpreter to a sinful nation. Wow. Well, of course there was no interpreter of the law. Why? Because the priests and the prophets who were the interpreters of God's word to the people showing them how to worship the Lord God, guess what? They had no revelation. Why? They had no desire to receive God's word. What they did receive was a drunken stupor and they intoxicated themselves with idolatry. Listen to what else. The Net Bible says, when there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. It seems to me that Isaiah is saying the priest and the prophets have cast it off restraint. What does Proverbs 29, 18 say? <laughs> the Amplified Bible says this. Where there is no vision or no uh, redemptive revelation of God, the people perish. The people perish. And that's exactly what's happening here. Check this out. I, I think this is remarkable. Look at what he says here. So the people have no clarity. They're wayward, they're crooked. For all the tables are full of vomit and filth. No place is clean. So there's nothing you could look to them for. Does it matter as they present it before you? It's like you can't follow them. And listen, he says here. So Isaiah, your message is meaningless to us. You're speaking to us like kids. You know, that's how some people that's that crown of pride. People don't like to be corrected. God's word is very corrective. And it's interesting how people want counsel, they say. The Bible talks about getting counsel. It doesn't say go to counseling. The Bible says that we receive our counsel from the word of God. Did you know that everything we're supposed to be doing is to be viewed through the lens of God's word? That's how we receive this biblical worldview in life. You know, the world does not accept this. The world, has, the world has no desire to follow this. Why? Because in their mind, they're going to say this is just blah, 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 blah. And the church's mission, the body of Christ, its mission is to be what Israel was supposed to be. A light to the nations around them. We are to be a light to our families. To We talked about this last week, right? We're to be a light to the nations around. Listen to this. And he's saying here, you can't do it. 
because you reject it. So they mocked the word of God. They, they mocked his messenger and they mocked his word. And, and, and this is what they're doing. For with, listen to this, verse 11, for with stammering lips and another tongue, he will speak to his people. So in other words, what he's saying here to them is this. I am going to have to use another means to speak to you. So you like to mock? For with stammering lips and another tongue, the other tongue would be the Assyrians. Another language, another tongue is now going to speak to you. In other words, when God speaks, he speaks through his prophet. He speaks in his word. But you know that God also speaks through chastening and God speaks through circumstances. That's why some people say as they're going through something because they're living in disobedience, right? When you live in disobedience and maybe you read the verse in the Bible, anybody ever been disobedient? Okay, like eight of us in here, the rest of you. Hey, God bless you guys in your little holy lives that you don't do nothing wrong. But have you ever been disobedient? Okay, and have you ever read a verse in the Bible that is speaking to your disobedience and you're seeing that you're wrong and you're reading it? but you still choose to be disobedient? I've done that. Many of us have. And if you say no, you're lying. And you know the Bible says, all liars. So you just did it right now. <laughs> That's the reality of it. Why? Because it's in our sin nature to resist and reject God. That's what it is. And you might say, well... I, you know, I don't disobey it, but, you know, I, I just I don't agree with it at the time. But eventually I do it. That's still the, the, partial obedience is whole disobedience. Period. And look at what's happening here. Then the Lord says, OK, well, then here here's the word. Receive it. They say we don't want to receive it. They got the crown of pride on right now. Listen to this. And, and, then, and then he says, okay, well, then I'm going to have to use another means to speak to you. When God speaks, listen to this. For with stammering lips and another tongue, he will speak to his people. Wow. So rejecting God's word, then the Lord will speak by other means. So he says here very clearly, I'm going to speak to you with another language. What does that mean? I think this is an interesting thing. To him, who he said, this is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest. You know, this, this whole picture here is the Lord promising them a, a place of rest. The Lord is saying, listen, there is refreshing. If you just do what I say, you will have rest. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 11. He, he made it very clear in verses 28 and 29. Jesus promises rest, does he not? I will give you true rest. Come unto me, all you who are tired and weary and heavy laden. You would think that they would be tired of just living in idolatry. But he says, I have to speak to you a different way. That's why some people say, man, God really got my attention. I went through that situation. I know what the Bible says, but I was being hard headed. Then I had to go through this and God. Really, why does it have to get that far? That's exactly what the Lord is saying here. Like, I'm, I'm giving you rest. But Assyria would be that means by which he would do that. Now, this is interesting here because this is a message of judgment and a message of which the Lord would deal with them. Paul, the apostle in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, uses the same idea. He then also uses what the Lord is speaking here in regards to another language being used for the means of, you know, dealing with those who perhaps are rejectors of God's message. And, and Paul then speaks as he covers the basic is, issues which, which he was dealing with regarding the speaking in a language as the gift of the Holy Spirit. Number one, its position 
inferior to prophecy. And number two, its purpose as a sign to unbelievers. And three, its procedures and its systematic limited and orderly. What Paul is saying here is that God used it to minister to his people. And the gift of tongues that we see in the New Testament was a sign to unbelievers. In the same way here that God's going to use another language, a known language of the Assyrian language, to speak to his people by the captivity. In the New Testament, God used a known language. It was a known language to those who were hearing it in their own language. And when God's message was spoken on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came down, what happened? The people time and time again had opportunity to receive of God's word, to receive of God's message, but they didn't. They rejected God's messenger and message. Who was the messenger? Jesus. And they rejected him. And the Lord says, and I will speak to you by... Now, I know that this is speaking about an army. And the Assyrians will come and they will take them. So a foreign language is going to now speak to you. You're going to learn by this circumstance that you're soon going to find yourself in. And so in a sense, a message of judgment. But isn't it interesting that when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, some 40 years later, in a sense, the promise of the Father was also a reminder of a judgment that was going to come. Because Jesus promised that the Father would send a comforter, right? Jesus also promised that one stone would not be left upon another. And after the Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, in 70 AD, the temple was destroyed. Can you imagine the thought? In the day of Isaiah, as he's speaking this word to the people of Judah, and he's saying, look at your brothers Ephraim as an example. Assyria comes, now another language, stammering lips. Okay, so you don't want to hear my message? Well, I'm going to speak my message through a language that is foreign to you. Let's see if you listen then. And they remove them out of the land, and it's interesting. You would think that the people of Judah would say, we don't want that to happen to us, but it did. And the day that it took place, their temple was destroyed in 586 B.C. I would say to a degree, this is maybe not far-fetching or stretching this whole thing, but, but Isaiah's reference to this was very clear. That through another language, God was speaking to his people. And you want to know what they said in, uh, in Peter's day on the day of Pentecost? What did they say when God spoke through another language? They said they're drunk. They rejected God's message. They're drunk. And the Bible says, as Paul would write to the believers at Corinth, he says the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. So rather than make a covenant with God and receive the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit, because That's the means by which the new covenant comes, right? The indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer now makes us members of the new covenant. But to reject God's covenant, to reject the Spirit, to reject the message of God is to say, Lord, I have no desire to have a covenant with you. So what did those who rejected the message on Pentecost make a covenant with? Death. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. I don't know if this is a correlation, but I'd I'd like it to be. As you guys know, I like to see things that the Lord is saying, hey, listen, this is how it's to be. Here's another phenomenon. You know, where did languages come from? God created them. In Genesis chapter 11, man's attempts to reach heaven. They wanted to build a tower that would what? So Nimrod, who really wanted to be God to the people, he felt, you know, this is all mine. So he had them building this this tower to heaven, and they really felt that by reaching this, by, by building it as high as they possibly could, that it would be a means by which they could rule and dominate. They wanted to reach God by their own means, the work of their own hands. Well, we know that then the Lord says, you know, they they're desiring if they can achieve this, they will dominate the people. 
because the people will begin to believe, man, if you built it, then you're the guy. Idolatry once again. And the world was going in that direction. This is like after the flood, man. If you thought they would have learned, they didn't. Even God's people made a mistake. What did Noah do? The blessing that God gave him, what did he turn it into? A curse. What's the first thing he did after he got off the boat? He got drunk. I mean, really think about this. And then look at what happens. So here they go. They're building the Tower of Babel, you know, whatever the case. That's why we call it the Tower of Babel, which means rebellion and, and, and rejection, resisting. Right? And, and then what happens? The Lord then confused their language. And all of a sudden, all of them started speaking different languages so they could not communicate together no more. And, you know, when you attempt to reach God, by the work of your own hands, there will always be confusion. Because then it's your doing. And it's interesting that there, when it was man's attempt to be drawn close to God, when they said, we're not going to wait for what God has, we're going to do it ourselves, we're going we're to go, we're going to reach, we're going to make it happen on our own. And listen to this, this should always be a testament to every single one of you sitting here this morning, no matter how young, no matter how old you are. Until we leave this earth, you will always be presented every single day with an opportunity to trust God or not trust God. And listen, you older people here, this is why us younger people look to you, not because you've had more experiences in life. The very fact that you have walked with God longer than us should be a clear indication that you're not relying on the experiences you've had in life. But you're daily relying on the word of God, fresh and anew, and still in your older age, looking to the Lord as the source of strength and wisdom and guidance and direction. So us younger people can see that to rely on God's word, we don't ever arrive. It is a daily need in your life as well. Because nobody could ever say, even years later, we've arrived. This is what Christianity looks like after walking with the Lord for 50 years. Are you kidding me? If that's the best it is, I want nothing to do with it. Because that's not what God's ultimate end is for us. He's making you more like Jesus. That's what the Bible says, right? And so what happens there now is they're going and they're building this tower, you know, and they're like, you know, hey, pass, pass me this brick, you know, and it's like... Next thing you know, God confuses the language and one of them's like, Orale, pasa mi otra. And the other guy turns and looks at him, Konnichiwa, Konnichiwa, Shishi, Shishi, you know, and <laughs> it's all jacked up from there. They can't complete it. But when Jesus tells the disciples, as I said earlier today in Luke's gospel, tarry in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. Nimrod wanted to go on high. It's the same thing Satan, Isaiah said Satan wanted to do in Isaiah 14. He wanted his throne on high. Nimrod wanted to be on high. Jesus says the way to get high on the most high is to tarry in Jerusalem until you receive that power, until God fulfills his promise. So you wait upon the Lord. And listen to this, when the Holy Spirit came, God confused their language in Genesis 11. They spoke one language in Acts chapter 2 by way of the Holy Spirit. What was lost by man's attempt to reach God was restored by God when man trusted and waited for the promise. You see, the beautiful picture that I would say, even on this day, guys, listen, over 2,000 years ago, the church received the work and ministry, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to do the work that God called them to do. Jesus said, I must go so he can come. And so here, we see that this language, this other tongue, would be the instrument or the means by which God would speak his message still, even though he did it through the circumstance of Assyria and their foreign language to the Hebrew people and saying, you're going to get this message one way or another. It is either going to be received or if you don't listen 
to the verbal warning, you will get the real life fulfillment. Oh boy, I want to opt out of that one. I don't know about you. He goes on to say here, to whom he said, this is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. Yet they would not hear. Wow. He says they would not hear. They rejected God's rest. In the New Testament, Jesus says that he is the true rest. Does he not say that? Right? Matthew chapter 11. So to reject God's rest in the Old Testament, it's equivalent to what in the New Testament? Rejecting Jesus. You see, it's an interesting dynamic here. And the Lord is saying, I offered you rest. I offered you a message. You tell Isaiah, blah, 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 blah. You speak to us like little kids. It's the same thing, line upon line, precept upon, pre get out of here. It's really what they're saying here. And he says, but the word of the Lord was to them. And, and the Lord is saying, precept upon precept, line upon line. They had no desire for Isaiah's message and they never received it seriously. They mocked him, guys. They rejected God's word. They mocked Isaiah. Now listen to this. You might think by mocking the messenger that you're freed from mocking God. The Bible says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. And next week we're going to look at why God allows mocking, but why mocking is so dangerous. And we're going to look at the line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. This whole picture of mocking God. It never brings them to a place of truly understanding who the Lord is. Now, just listen to this for a moment, because they were devoid of God's living. They were devoid of his living and they were really had no desire to receive his message, nor did they have a desire to live in his presence. They were intoxicated priests, intoxicated prophets. They viewed the word of the Lord, listen to this, as meaningless, as Jibber jabber is what they would say. All it was was a little more of just a little set of rules and regulations. They didn't like it. They had no desire. They considered themselves, listen to this guys, above these basic principles. And they says, we have no desire to follow it. They were seen without perceiving this is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 13 and verses 4, 14 and 15. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says you will indeed hear, but never understand. You will, excuse me, indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull and their ears, they can barely hear. They had no desire. Their hearts became callous, their ears became dull, and their eyes closed. That's what Isaiah chapter 6 in verses 9 and 10 says. He said, go and say to this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy, as blind as their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears. So putting their complaint into modern terms... It would not be an exaggeration to say that what they were saying ultimately was that, you know, God's word is just junk, gibberish. So this disrespect shown to Isaiah, shown to God by their rejection and the rejection of God's word, it was met with pronounced judgment. And that's what he's saying here. For stammering lips of another tongue will speak to his people. God calls out these drunken prophets, these drunken priests, and as they are rejecting Isaiah's word, God says, very well then, with foreign lips and strange tongues, God will speak to his people. Since they claim that Isaiah's preaching and message, guys, was childish and gibberish and nothing more than babble, God would ensure that their future lesson would be delivered in a foreign tongue, specifically the Assyrian army. And in all of this, guys, it's important for us to consider what he goes on to say here. You may cause the weary to rest. 
And this is the refreshing. Yet they would not hear, but the word of the Lord was to them. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and caught. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scornful men who rule this people who are in Jerusalem because you have said we have made a covenant with what? Wow. They made their own covenant with death. By rejecting the message of God, they put their trust in other gods and idols. And the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the way thereof leads to death. And with Sheol, we are in agreement with the overflowing scourge, uh, scourge passes through. It will not come to us for we have made lies our refuge and under falsehood we have hidden ourselves. Wow, doesn't that sound like the world we're living in today? We have made lies our refuge. And under falsehood, we've hidden ourselves. Now, when you think of this, pay attention. And I say this, I'm not just talking about what a specific party is doing and the way the whole world, I'm talking about the church. Because there are churches and pastors and people that are following lies. And their covenant is not with Jesus. Their covenant is not with the Lord. They have done what these priests and prophets have done. They have, they have become drunk with the sin of the world by putting on a crown of pride rather than understanding that God is the giver. As we read last week, right? Jesus says, my reward comes with me. I have crowns for you guys. We looked at the five crowns that the New Testament speaks of, right? Right? And these crowns are for the purpose of what? Not so that we can parade ourselves, so that we can get on our knees and bow down and cast them at the feet of Jesus when we see him. But today, the church, in some facets, even dear brothers of mine, have paraded themselves with a crown of pride. It's no more humility. The simplicity of God's word, it's as if it has to be taught different. No, it just needs to be taught the same. And ultimately, there are going to be those that are going to say, you know, here a little, there a little, blah, blah, blah. Pastor David, you say the same thing over and over again. Or you know what? You know what's the one excuse in this church why people don't come back here to Living Way? They said, if I wanted to go to Bible college, I would go to school. I don't need to be taught like I'm in seminary. So you're like the ones here a little, there a little, precept upon precept, line upon line. Wow. Wow. You know what? A day is going to come when this word will be scarce. Right now it's not. So we're going to proclaim it and preach it. And I will continue to in that day. But to find a good Bible teaching church that sticks to the truth of God's word, it's hard these days. Very hard. Don't allow the crown of pride to bring you to a place where you make a covenant with death and lies are your refuge and you hide yourself under falsehood. Look to the Lord. The Lord offers an alternative in the next several verses and the, the alternative is Jesus. Look to him, rest in him, trust in him. Why? Why? because the message hasn't changed. Jesus is still seated on the throne.